suffragism and the Great War, doing their bit, suffrage societies and their contribution to the Great War. Let's go start in autumn 1916, when the prefect of Constanza, Romania's largest port, wrote, No wonder England is such a great country if her women are like that. For several weeks he had first heard about then witnessed the activities of a group of suffrage supporting British women who, seemingly oblivious to guns, shells and bombs, had provided field hospital services to Romanian and Serb soldiers who were being massacred by the advancing Germans and Bulgarians. One of the women he so much admired was much more prosaic. Writing in her diary about the pending fall of Constanza, Something very disastrous has occurred somewhere, and things are very serious. She adds, we may all of us be prisoners before the night comes. In fact, that seems at present no slender possibility. But if it's to be, it's to be. And what's the use of worrying? She completes her entry for that October day by cynically commenting, that the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, of which she was a member and under whose umbrella she was working, was actually less bothered about what happened to the women serving overseas than whether their actions would attract favourable press coverage and help keep votes for women in the public eye. Precisely what the diarist, her co-workers and thousands of other women had been striving for since the very moment that war was declared. Perhaps that last comment, striving for votes for women, strikes some of you as slightly surprising, because for decades, and even still today, the received wisdom is that the declaration of war on the 4th of August 1914 stopped the suffragists in their tracks, that they abandoned their 50-year-long struggle for the vote and were subsequently rewarded for their wartime loyalty by some women being given the vote in the February 1918 Representation of the People Act. Inevitably, this narrative contains a modicum of truth, but the story of the suffrage movements between 1914 and 1918 is far more nuanced. It covers multiple theatres of war and is as complex and as intriguing as some of the characters who you will meet during the next 50 or so minutes. So, <coughs> let's roll the clock back to 8pm on the 4th of August 1914. Horrified that after all the toings and froings of the last 72 hours, and indeed some of their own considerable efforts, war now seemed ine inevitable, the leaders of all the main suffrage societies had arranged a women's rally for peace at the Kingsway Hall in Hoban. 2,000 women piled into the hall. Hundreds of others were forced to wait outside as some of the most revered leaders of the suffrage campaigns, apart from Emmeline and Christabel Pankhurst, who did not deign to attend. The others listened to Millicent Fawcett, long-standing president of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, as she urged the government to step back from the brink. Women who had spent decades campaigning for the vote cheered as Millicent declared, war is insensate devilry. Nevertheless, she reminded the women present that as citizens, they too had their duty to perform. By the time the meeting ended, just after 10 p.m. on the 4th of August 1914, war was but an hour away. The next four years would change the rally's attendees and their nation forever. A skilled orator, Millicent Fawcett, had used the word citizen with good intent. Probably seems strange nowadays, but in 1914, to many politicians and indeed to many people, women were not considered to be citizens. Indeed, Prime Minister Asquith doubted whether they were truly human at all, but instead some sort of subspecies. The argument went that only those who could defend the wartime, the nation in wartime were citizens and thus entitled to vote. As women could not bear arms, they could not be citizens. 
And therefore, if they weren't citizens, they couldn't vote. Simple. Occasionally, overtly, covertly, generally overtly, this idea of demonstrating citizenship is what underpinned all suffrage women and their societies' actions from the 4th of August to the 11th of November, 1918. And it was the skills that they had acquired over the past 50 years in campaigning for the vote that enabled them to step up to the mark and play crucial roles in securing victory on both the home and the war fronts. Because, of course, wars are not won on the battlefield alone. One of the many platform speakers on that fateful 4th of August evening was a veteran campaigner, not only for the vote and for women to be considered full citizens, but also of the recent Balkan Wars. She was 52-year-old Mabel Stobart, and she spoke with inside knowledge when she declared to the, on the platform that war was a barbarity. She knew better than most what war entailed because she had spent two years in the field nursing the wounded of the Balkan War. Once war was declared, and with her passionate belief that women both could and should play a part in national defence, Mabel sprung into action. Using multiple suffrage contacts, this was something that all the suffrage women did throughout the war, they used their contacts in order to get what they wanted and to play a part. And they also had superb organisational skills, and these again were the hallmark of almost all of the suffrage movements. And so Mabel used contacts, she used her organisational skills, and she offered a mobile hospital unit to the British Red Cross. They turned her down. So, used, like all suffrage women, to rejection, this was something that was sort of part and parcel of their being by 1940, she nicked round to Belgrave Square, to the Belgian Embassy, and she offered her women sick and wounded convoy to Belgium via the Belgian am ambassador. There's Mabel, there's the ambassador. You can probably guess who is the stronger willed of the two. <laughs> the Belgian ambassador, who was something, known to be something of a dandy, had already proved himself to be no match for determined suffrage women. And once again, he was unable to withstand Mabel's assault, and she set off for Belgium. And by a stroke of bad timing, she arrived in the capital just as the German army entered Brussels on August the 20th, 1914. So the war is barely a fortnight old. Mabel has got herself over to, to Belgium and she arrives to see the German army enter Brussels. She watched in horrified silence as that pitiless pageant of triumphant enmity passed during three days and three nights through the streets of the Belgian capital in a silence that was unforgettable. But the unit moved from Brussels to still unoccupied <coughs> Antwerp. Soon, the hospital that she was set up was in the direct line of fire of the ammunition depot. And the hospital, contrary to all um, rules of the um, Hague Convention, the hospital became a favored target. To her satisfaction, none of her female suffrage supporting staff took the slightest notice of the shells falling around them, but continued with their duties as though they had been accustomed to working under shell fire all their lives. By way of contrast, the American and British consuls fled the city long before Stobart decided that she should evacuate the unit to save their donated equipment. Saving equipment, which had frequently bought, been bought with suffrage societies hard-earned, hard-raised funds, was always high on the list of medical women's priorities. Stobart sought some transport out of the burning city, she writes. I stood on the road. There was no sound except the crackling of the flames of the houses over my head. Suddenly, I saw tearing along towards me at breakneck pace three London motor buses. I ran out into the road to stop them. I asked the drivers, British Tommies, if they could help me and my nurses to the frontier. The gallant three seated the women atop boxes of ammunition. <laughs> the renowned British phlegm, or perhaps it is black humour, enables the fleeing nurses in what one can only call jolly hockey stick manner to laugh merrily at the thought of what fine fireworks we should be in the middle of if a shell dropped our way. 
Back in England, with the Red Cross still rejecting her services, Stobart and her suffrage nurses and doctors <coughs> left for Serbia, where they served with very great distinction. After they'd come back from Serbia and back in England, aware of the terrible conditions that sick and wounded soldiers were facing in Mesopotamia in 1916, Stobart tried to make the government accept her offer of service. I leave you to guess the reply. Her offer to the British Red Cross was rejected in some, for some reason because she was a volunteer. Surely the British medical services would not, not be so dismissive of qualified women. Or would they? We're going to go back now to mid-September 1914. Two women were on a train bound for France. One of them, Louisa, would have heard her aunt, Millicent Fawcett, speak at the Kingsway Hall. Having settled herself into the train, she began writing to her mother, Millicent's sister, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, England's first female medical doctor, as well as her first female magistrate. Wishing she were 20 years younger, Liz Elizabeth had waved the two women goodbye. She said that if she weren't in her 70s, she would have gone with them. And despite her very advanced years, like her sister Millicent, her surgeon daughter Louisa, and Louisa's travelling companion, Dr. Flora Murray, Elizabeth was a confirmed suffragette. But unlike Millicent, who was what was called a constitutional suffragist, which meant campaigning for the vote using means that were always within the law, both Elizabeth and Louisa were militants, and they were the ones that the term suffragette, which was a derogatory term coined naturally by the Daily Mail. Um, <laughs> the Daily Mail referred to them as suffragettes, but they adopted the, the name with a certain amount of pride. But if you sort of read or do any research on suffragists, and suffragists were always the women who um, campaign for the vote within the law. The suffragettes were the ones who got involved in hunger strikes and, and window smashing and arson and burning pillar boxes, etc. So Elizabeth and Louisa were the militants. And in fact, to Aunt Millicent's horror, Louisa had indeed only recently spent a few weeks in prison for window smashing. Now, Louisa and Flora were going to France as heads of their own suffragette finance and newly founded Women's Hospital Corps. This was a step that would lead them to alter the Royal Army Medical Corps forever. The Women's Hospital Corps was in fact the result of a month's frenetic activity, again involving both suffrage supporters and an ambassador. Allied nations ambassadors to the UK were wearily used to suffrage women beating a path to their doors. Painfully familiar with the misogynism and anti-suffrage prejudice endemic in the British military, British medical, and by extension the British military medical hierarchy, Louisa and Flora had paid a call on the French ambassador. Knowing how understaffed the French army medical services were, and with the women having been a little economical with the truth, <laughs> The grateful ambassador advised the French Red Cross to accept their offer of a hospital unit and find it a home in Paris. Somehow, Louisa and Flora had omitted to tell His Excellency that all hospitals' medical staff were female and suffrage supporters to boot. That somehow just got lost. It's all very well to offer a hospital. These come with a heavy price tag. And so intensive fundraising followed, something which all suffrage societies had become superb at doing over the past 50 years. Within two weeks, £1,523, which is the equivalent of about 160000 today, had been raised, and the women were ready to make good on their offer. They were far from alone in believing, as Flora wrote, the suffrage movements had taught discipline and organisation it had shown women new possibilities in themselves and had inspired them with confidence in each other. Confidence that all suffrage come women's war leaders and most of the rank and file displayed in spades throughout the war. Once they arrived in Paris, lesser characters than Flora and Louisa might have been a bit less confident. The hospital's recently commandeered Paris home, the Hôtel Clavige, on the Champs-Élysées, 
might have boasted a prestigious address, but it had nothing else to recommend it. However, they quickly set about moulding both the hotel, which they called a gorgeous shell of marble and gilt, without heating or crockery or anything practical. So they moulded it and the French Red Cross to their will. According to Flora, the French authorities are no match for the mild militancy and unending push of the suffragist WHC personnel. Somehow, within a matter of days, the hotel was transformed and rendered fit for purpose. Flora recalled that once a gas steriliser and powerful electric lights were installed, the ladies' cloakroom, with its pavement access, its hot water supply and basins, was converted into an operating theatre. They were soon admitting horrifically wounded British, as well as French personnel, into rapidly transformed wards. This is what they started with. This type of um, um, reception room was transformed within a matter of days into, into wards that were, they had, would have beds that were sort of four rows thick, if you see what I mean, one at each side and two back to back. To back. Chief Surgeon Louisa and anaesthetist Flora to the med military medical authorities' amazement, proved at least as competent as male medics. Flora had said to all the women, and this was part of her sort of introductory speech to them, that you have to be more than good. Good isn't good enough for women. You have to be the best. And they lived up to her words on every possible occasion. So within a week of arriving in Paris, it's with its all-female, many erstwhile militant suffragette staff, Clarige was a smooth-running concern, and it got the reputation of being one of the foremost military hospitals in France. One nurse, Amelia Miles, commented, The wounded arrived in a terrible condition. One day, one of the women surgeons operated for seven hours at a stretch. Most of these patients were in the retreat of Mons, and, and they had suffered much. The most they had received by way of medical attention was a field dressing. Louisa wrote to her mother Elizabeth, We have 60 beds full and can take about 70 when the rest of our blankets arrive. Soon referred to as the two suffragette doctors, Louisa and Flora adopted the Women's Social and Political Union WSPU motto, Deeds, Not Words, as the hospital's guiding principle. However, they never missed an opportunity to advance women in medicine and women's right to vote, nor of photo opportunities, which the suffrage press agencies at home lapped up and passed around, so you'll find the same picture appearing in different newspapers on different, different days, because um, the suffra all the suffrage societies by 1914 had extremely well-oiled press agencies, and they made sure that all positive, even negative, but all suffrage activities were widely reported in um, newspapers. Many of the newspapers before the war were very, very anti-suffrage. And if you start to sort of follow and look at the newspapers as the war develops, they become more and more pro-suffrage as the, as the war lengthens. So it's quite interesting. You take something like the Times, which was hugely, hugely anti-suffrage, and actually had um, members of the anti-suffrage league. There was a league um, campaigning against women's vote. And a number of the journal journalists and editorial staff were members of the Anti-Suffrage League. And then eventually you see the Times um, sort of comments and attitude towards suffrage, um, women's suffrage change dramatically until the 12th of November 1918, but that's another story. So anyway, Flora made sure that senior officers of the British Army seldom came to Paris without including the women's hospital at the Clarige in their rounds of inspection. All of them were wowed. Whenever the suffrage badges all women proudly wore on their uniforms attracted comment, the suffrage medics explained their case. The women were not allowed to put up badges of rank to show their military rank, so instead they wore their suffrage bag badge to make a point quite um, overtly. At least one lieutenant colonel pronounced himself persuaded about the idea of women voting. The patients were equally enthusiastic. 
If I had the chance, I'd give them 10 votes apiece, declared one grateful Tommy. And even the British Medical Journal, which was not an advocate of votes for women, nor of, for women in medicine, acknowledged, if this institution were the sole hospital, sole British hospital in France, in the Hôtel Clapige, the medical profession in Great Britain might continue to regard itself as very well represented. That was high praise indeed from the BMJ, which had published um, before the war, it was publishing articles um, saying that forcible feeding, which we've all heard of women being forcibly fed, it was actually um, publishing articles to say that forcible feeding was not detrimental to a woman's health. So for it to take that sort of about turn and announce that the suffrage hospital was representing um, the British medical professional profession admirably was a huge fault for us. A steady stream of suffrage visitors ensured further press coverage. This again was something that the um, that all suffrage women would make sure that if they had journalist friends, they would come and, and visit um, what the societies were doing so that they could give favourable reports in the, in the press. One journalist, Louisa and Flora's suffragist friend Evelyn Sharp, commented on the irony of our civilization, which first compels men to tear one another to pieces like wild beasts for no personal reason, and then applies all its arts to patching them up in order to let them do it all over again. Somehow, when the patching is done by women, the ironic tragedy of the whole thing seems more evident. It was, Evelyn felt, a triumph for the militant suffrage movement that these two doctors, who had been prominent, indeed imprisoned members of the WSPU, were the first to break down the prejudices of the British War Office against accepting the service of women surgeons. On one occasion, Louisa reminded a patient, a former policeman, how he had once arrested me in Whitehall, to which he replied with embarrassment, I wouldn't have mentioned it, miss. Shall we let bygones be bygones? <laughs> <laughs> On the 19th of February, 1915, the erstwhile vehemently anti-suffrage times reported how, deeply impressed by the WHC's work and the staff's unflappability, Surgeon General to the Royal Army Medical Corps, Sir Alfred Kyo, had asked the women to take charge of a hospital of 500 beds, and if they pleased, of a hospital of 1,000 beds. This hospital in St Giles, Endell Street, near Covent Garden, an old workhouse recently occupied by Belgian refugees, and initially every bit as unfit for purpose as the Hotel Clarige was born. And in fact, it proved to be the most successful of all the London hospitals. And when um, casualties were being evacuated from the Somme, soldiers would beg to be sent to the WHC hospital in, in Endell Street. But sadly, the story of this hospital, <coughs> the only all-female hospital unit to be run under the auspices of the RAMC, dubbed the Suffragette Hospital, and which directly led to women being taken on as medics by the RAMC will have to be told another day. For another impatient suffrage woman is about to set off on her war service. So what I'd like to do now is introduce you to a famous actress, a notorious supporter of women's suffrage, and a founder member of the Tax Resistance League, whose principle was no taxation without representation. <laughs> The a number of suffrage women gathered together and formed this um, no, um, tax resistant league because they argued that if they had no say in the way the government spent their money, they would in fact not pay tax. Most of them, when war was declared, decided that they would, they would pay up. Not Evelyn Sharp, who was um, Louisa and um, Flora's friend, and you saw a picture of her a couple of minutes ago. She actually refused to pay tax throughout the war and it got to the point where the government sent in a bailiff and he um, would sit in her, in her flat all day, every day and by the time he finally left, you'll be delighted to hear that she had converted him to the cause of votes for women and he subsequently didn't take as much of her furniture as he should have taken. But anyway, Lena, Lena Ashwell, who had refused to pay her tax up until 1914, 
In early August 1914, she, along with hundreds of other women, attended, let's get a picture of Lena up, attended a great meeting in London's Albert Hall, where leaders of the government addressed different groups of women. It took them rather a long time to say that the woman's place in wartime was the home. <laughs> By October 1914, having worked out that her place was emphatically not the home, Lena set about arousing <coughs> interest in her proposed idea of entertainments for the troops. With the backing of generals, bishops, distinguished musicians and actors, she appealed to the war office. We were considered useless, but using suffrage perseverance, she chipped away, and eventually, Princess Elena Victoria, president of the YMCA, who incidentally opened the YMCA building in, in Chelmsford, Princess Elena Victoria intervened and asked Lena to send a trial concert party to Le Havre. The problem was that the actors and concert parties were far outside the very Christian YMCA's comfort zone. And according to Lena, YMCA leaders were deeply worried about what unknown terrors they were letting loose upon themselves. Some expected us to land in France in tights with peroxide hair. <laughs> According to 19-year-old Elsie Griffin, who thanks to her experiences with the concert parties went on to have an illustrious opera career, the girls were locked into a caravan at night. She doesn't specify for whose protection this was. <laughs> Despite the YMCA's angst, this trial concert proved an overwhelming success and the Lena Ashwell's concert parties for troops were born. Sadly, there is actually no extant recording of this song, which was written for Elsie, which she made particularly her own, and which you may recognise. Roses are shining in Picardy In the hush of the silver Roses are flowering in Picardy, but there's never a rose like you. And the roses will die in the summertime, and our Maybe far apart, but there's one rose that dies not in Picardy. It's the one rose I'll keep in my heart. And this was, in fact, became Elsie Griffin's hallmark song and um, one that became hugely popular and, of course, is still forms very much part of our memory of the war today, of Roses Are Shining in Picardy. One problem would have overwhelmed a less hardy campaigner. Concerts had to be totally self-supporting. The first of countless fundraising events took place at the London Coliseum. Using her contacts, another well-honed suffrage skill, Lena approached theatre manager and impresario Oswald Stoll, who secured, for free, a company of artists whose usual rates would have amounted to over £5,000, which is about half a million today. The audience included Queens, Alexandra and Mary, Princesses Mary and Helena Victoria, Prince Alexander of Tech, and here we go again, Allied Ambassadors. The um, actual concert, the actual event at the Colosseum raised the equivalent of about 152 and a half, half thousand pounds for three proposed parties. The first of Lena's modern troubadours arrived in France 
in early 1915. Some were leading lights of the London stage, who, to the troops' amazement, were prepared to brave knee-deep mud, candlelit huts, barns or tents, and for two hours sing us the songs, the songs of our own land. It was immediately obvious <coughs> that artists really did contribute to troop welfare and morale. Indeed, some men began to consider that other than a blighty wound, which would have enabled them to go back to England, a Lena Ashwell concert party was the best thing that could happen to them. Troubadours performed in hospitals where for a short while they lightened the atmosphere impregnated with pain and concentrated suffering for patients, nurses and doctors. Sometimes the audiences comprised as many as 600 and on more than one occasion a soldier died peacefully as the violinist played at his bedside. Soon, even the War Office acknowledged the concert party's <coughs> crucial contribution to morale, as long as they didn't have to fund them. <laughs> a typical party consisted of four female and three male artistes. Each would sing or play about 50 songs a day. An average of three parties went out every five weeks, and as well as visiting bases behind the line, there were also three firing line parties, that would perform within 800 yards of the German trenches. Nina resisted attempts to charge even a small entrance fee. To her, each note sung was a loving gift from home. Fundraising was never ending, with suffrage mechanism again in action. Publicity in newspapers, a constant round of flag days. But for, at least for the women who were selling those flags, most of whom were suffrage supporters, there was a novelty. When they tried to raise money before the war for the suffrage societies, they had to stand in the gutter. Because standing on, in the pavement, selling flags or raising money for charity, was illegal if you didn't have a license. And no license would be given to any suffrage societies. So the women had to stand in the gutter because the law specified that you had to be standing on the pavement. So they just stood in the gutter to sell, to sell <laughs> flags for, or raise money or sell the suffrage newspapers. But once they started raising money for the war effort, then novelty of novelties, they could actually stand on the, on the pavement. <laughs> Meetings were held in public and private venues, and a typical event would raise the equivalent of £180,000 today, and that would pay for 18 concerts. Towns often raised money to send a party consisting of local artistes to their boys. This was in the days when you had the Pals Battalions, which I'm sure you've heard of, when groups of men would join up together and would form a Pals Battalion. And local towns would raise money for their own, own boys and a concert party would be sent to that particular battalion. The words of one modern troubadour have been seared into our national consciousness. I know you will recognise them. Now, I was going to invite you to sing along, but you might have to do the singing all on your own, because thanks to Lena Ashwell, Keep the Home Fires Burning was first sung in the Havre by Ivan Novello in um, one of the very early concert parties. So our 
arguably, thanks to the suffrage societies, we had keep the home fires burning. Lena remembered, when I was sang it, the men seemed to drink it in at once and instantly sang the chorus. And as we drove away at the end of the concert, in the dark and the rain and the mud, from all parts of the camp, one could hear the refrain, keep the home fires burning. Drama was soon added to the repertoire. Lena herself loved to perform Shakespeare. No one cared if this was in slightly unusual venues, such as a horse hospital, or that heavy rain fell both on the patients wheeled out into the open air and on Lady Macbeth declaiming in their midst. Rain drenched or not, Lena knew that the sight of our girls is the very salt of life to these poor, pain-wracked boys. Concert parties soon headed for Malta with, with its 20,000 hospital, hospital beds, Palestine and Egypt. In Cairo, audiences regularly exceeded 6,000. And according to poet Siegfried Sassoon, for those listening in the sp desert spellbound, we hear them, drink them, till the concert's done. Lena's most adventurous and illegal fundraising event occurred on the 3rd, 4th and 5th of December 1917 at the Royal Albert Hall, scene of numerous suffrage meetings. Lotteries being illegal and yet by any other name might smell as sweet, she dubbed hers a Petticoat Lane Tombola. It seemed that all society hostesses yearned to run a stall and a truly impressive array of five and a half thousand or four hundred and forty thousand pounds in today's money worth of prizes were donated, including two acres of land on the Chiltern Hills, complete with the then equivalent of planning permission, a grand piano, a diamond necklace, a porcelain bathroom, um, but the prize which excited the most interest was a prize pedigree bull. <laughs> However, this caused a certain amount of consternation amongst the office staff who were working round the clock to cope with the demand for tickets, which cost five shillings, which is about 20 pounds. Where exactly does one tether a prize bull in central London? <laughs> On the opening day, Mrs. Asquith, the anti-suffrage wife of Herbert Asquith, he who didn't think that women were, were human at all, and herself a founder of suffragists before the war, insisted on solemnly parading the bull round the hall. I hope she had the equivalent of a doggy poo bag with her. <laughs> so many tickets had been sold for the event that they had <coughs> to be mixed in a beer barrel lent by a brewery. A troop of Boy Scouts came out and rolled out the barrel to make sure that the contents were thoroughly mixed. Admiral of the Fleet, Lord Jellicoe, drew the prizes, but a frisson of anxiety went through the crowd when a policeman appeared. Would he declare the tombola a lottery and thus illegal? All was well. He had simply dropped in to see if he had a winning ticket. <laughs> the tombola raised the staggering equivalent of, in today's money, £2,706,000. Keep your heart out, Debbie. Concerts continued post-war, accompanying both the Army of Occupation and entertaining soldiers impatiently awaiting demobilisation. The soldiers called these modern troubadours the fairy godmother of us all. During the four years of life of the concert parties at the front, Lena explains that every means short of highway robbery were used to keep the shows on the road and the troops entertained. If Lena spent a great deal of her time fundraising, one suffragist spent almost all of the war raising huge amounts of money for one of the most ambitious of all the wartime suffrage ventures, which started right back in August 1914. Scottish surgeon and president of the Edinburgh National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, Dr. Elsie Ingalls, had two passions in life, suffragism and surgery. Despite all the odds stacked against women medics, Elsie, by 1914, 
was one of Edinburgh's leading surgeons as well as philanthropists. When war was declared, she rushed to offer her services to the Royal Army Medical Corps. Their response? My dear lady, go home and sit still. <laughs> Talented though she was, sitting still was not in Elsie's skill set. So she decided to do the very opposite. President of the Scottish section of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, she persuaded the Edinburgh Bar branch to form and undertake the financing of what would become the Scottish Women's Hospital Unit for Foreign Service, or SWH. This was supported throughout the war entirely by voluntary do donations. Units served in France, Serbia, Russia, Macedonia, Salonika, and Corsica. Indeed, when the Prefect of Constanza passed his comment about British women being so great, he was in fact referring to the SWH. Another of Elsie's skills was recognising sometimes hidden talents in younger women, and her eye fell upon a young Oxford and Sorbonne graduate suffragist, Kathleen Burke. By spring 1915, after a spell working overseas, Kathleen was being employed as secretary in the SWH's Knightsbridge office. And thanks to her innate ability to spot potential in younger women and indeed follow a hunch, in mid-May 1915, Elsie Ingalls set Kath an initially very reluctant Kathleen on a life-changing path. Kathleen's pleas that she had never undertaken a public speaking engagement, nor did she want to, fell on deaf ears. She was dispatched to Oxford to replace Elsie. As suffrage societies had long ago learned, once Elsie had made up her mind, gainsaying her was absolutely impossible. Indeed, in early November 1917, even Russian leader Trotsky was unable to do so. But that again is a story for another day. Kathleen's mission in May 1915 was to raise money, lots of it please, for the SWH. She discovered she had a natural talent. Hosted by suffrage societies, she was soon speaking the length and breadth of the land, eloquently pleading the SWH cause and its never-ending need for funds to enable it to continue to serve both the French and the Serb armies. From June 1915, her name appears constantly in British new newspapers, where she is billed as having just returned from the front, talking charmingly, always reminding attendees that the NUWSS, the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, founded and funded the hospitals. In August 1915, she received the French ambassador when he visited the SWH Knightsbridge office to inspect the magnificent travelling X-ray motor car with entirely novel tent attachment, which had cost the equivalent of 153,000 and was being offered to France. Mm -hmm. Kathleen had raised the lion's share of the money. The French um, ambulance services at the beginning of the war, the ambulances they often used, were two, two um, bicycles with a stretcher balanced between them. <laughs> so this idea of having a, a fully mobile um, ambulance unit complete with an x-ray was certainly very novel and gratefully received. By December 1915, Kathleen was without doubt amongst the SWH's most valuable asset, and so they sent her off on a three-month, 10,000-mile tour of Canada and America. The £10,000 set as her to money to raise to set as her target is about 106,000 today. In a sexist comment, the Daily Mirror felt she had shown how good looks and business capacity can sometimes go together. <laughs> Transatlantic audiences were soon as captivated as British ones by Kathleen's quick wit and repartee. She was the first woman ever invited to speak on the New York Stock Exchange where she raised the equivalent of £212,000 from one speech. By July 1916, the SWH were a one and a quarter million pounds the richer. This meant they could make good on the promise that if sufficient funds were raised, American donations would support an America unit. America, American and Canadian newspapers now dubbed Kathleen 
the $1,000 a day girl due to her spectacular fundraising success. Accounts of her speaking engagement show her very deftly mixing women's rights to full citizenship and the vote with fundraising. Headlines such as Miss Kathleen Burke recently returned from the battlefront proved crowd drawers. Pleading for audience sympathy, she frequently commented that she found public speaking more daunting than shells, of which, as she explained to her audience, she had experience and was about to get more. Back in England, with barely time to unpack, she was off again. This time, she was sent to Verdun, the first English woman to enter what she called a white city of desolation. And she cleverly wrote a book about it. Um, you can guess where all the money raised went to the SWH. Over 200,000 French and German soldiers actually lost their lives at Verdun or were severely wounded between the 21st of February and mid-July 1916. Having met Generals Nivelle and Pétain and dined with General Joffre, they were all as impressed by her as she was them. She reminded the generals that the SWH was formed out of the suffrage movement with its intense desire to serve humanity. Like all suffrage societies, the SWH <coughs> London Committee had an extremely well-oiled press-cutting agency, and to their delight, not to mention intense efforts behind the scenes, her Verdun travels attracted massive press, press interest on both <coughs> sides of the Atlantic. Comments such as, a mere slip of a girl, Miss Burke stood calmly by the side of officers of Verdun, while big shells were dropping about, proliferated, and, of course, did the suffrage, as WH caused, no harm. France called her a knight of tenderness and pity, and she received France's golden palm for her impressive eloquence on behalf of wounded soldiers. By late 1917, she had raised nearly 23 million pounds in America alone for the SWH America unit. She was gazetted honorary colonel of the 138th US Field Artillery, and she was awarded the British CBE. She became a Knight of St. Sava in Serbia and a Chevalier of the Légion d'Honneur. The young woman who told the SWH committee she was not sure if she had the skills to undertake that 1915 Oxford speaking engagement had surpassed all expectations, and she had earned the highest praise that SWH founder and suffragist surgeon Dr. Elsie Ingalls could bestow on any member of staff. Dear girl, I knew you could do it. <laughs> but what exactly were the SWH doing to need such a continuous and determined fundraising effort? By the time Kathleen was roped into service, they had served with distinction in France and Serbia, and Elsie was determined to broaden their remit and, of course, the demonstration that women were every bit as worthy of citizenship and the vote as men. So, as time is now running out, let's go back to where this talk started and join the SWH, as well as the Serb <coughs> and Romanian armies, in early October 1916, as they set up a field hospital, something that they were by now adept at doing within earshot of guns. A field hospital was basically a hospital that sort of followed the the troops and would, would set up in order to um, give the first stage of, of aid. One volunteer, Yvonne Fitzroy, explained, we could hear most of the guns most of the morning, adding, the first Bosch shell that comes this way must surely bump into the hospital. From October the 4th to October the 9th, 1916, staff worked as many of these now highly experienced women had never worked before not even during the height of the suffrage campaigns. Yvonne explains, We were at it without break from 7.30 that morning Wednesday until 1.30 on Thursday morning, then on again from 7.30 a.m. until 8.30 that night. Excellent diaries and letters heap praise on the young ambulance drivers who were led by another leading light or thorn in the side of the government, depending on your point of view, Militant suffragette Evelina Haverfield. She was actually one of the first women to ride astride in, um, in England. And during the height of the suffrage militancy, she um, acquired the skill of tapping police horses behind their knees 
So they would then buckle, their knees would then buckle and deposit the um, mounted policeman very unceremoniously <laughs> on, the, on the ground. She did spend quite a lot of time in prison, <laughs> which she always used um, for good publicity. But she was taken on to lead the transport column and she um, wrote, Our transport girls did splendidly and went right up to the line to fetch the wounded. We had some appalling cases. Meanwhile, the unit doctor sang the praises of the young Scottish girls driving that nightmare 14 miles of mountain road. During the first two or three days, it had been almost more than they could stand when the cases, mostly abdominal wounds, died in their ambulances on the way down. Many medics and surgeons would, would actually um, feel that the abdominal wounds were the worst that they had to deal with and being sort of driven over rocky terrain was of course a nightmare for both the wounded and for the drivers themselves. The work and the conditions were backbreaking. Every bed and blanket is taxed to the utmost tonight, wrote one of them. And to make matters worse, having all the cases on the floor makes it very difficult work. There is so much bending. Patients on straw-strewn beds were lying on the floor, all along the corridors, down the stairs, in the hallways, anywhere there was enough space to lie them down. As to equipment, what we haven't got, we invent. And what we can't invent, we do without. Luckily, we could invent some speakers. The SWH had to do more than cope with a never-ending stream of wounded. And with only seven doctors handling over 11,000 wounded, their work was indeed cut out. They also had to face the realities of battle. Aeroplane duel just outside, but the shells didn't hit. During air raids, they simply carried on, as the unit administrator Mary Henderson explained in one of her many letters to the MUWSS committee at home. Three of the transport were driving today, and two bombs dropped about 10 yards from them. Lucky they weren't killed. Bombs became a daily hazard. Unit cook Mary Mill would not allow a few bombs to prevent her from feeding staff and patients. Her description mixes the horror and the mundaneness of war. She writes, Suddenly it seemed as if the end of the world had come. Sixty bombs were dropped just below us. Earth and debris shot into the air, and it seemed almost at the same minute all the anti-aircraft guns were shooting at once. Shells were whistling through the air, machine guns rattling. At the moment I was cutting up carrots for my boiled mutton, standing over my campfire. I nearly fell into it with shock. Another bomb dropped a hundred yards from us. It is a wonderful life, but a very dangerous one. Twelve men were killed and several bad badly wounded. Then the guns began very much nearer and wounded from the front started pouring in. An article in the suffragist newspaper Common Cause, which lapped up information about the SWH, reassured readers that despite having daily having German aeroplanes over their camp, our girls showed the utmost disregard for danger and upheld very well the British tradition of clock. Elsie Ingalls told the London Committee the thrice daily raids had become part of the fabric of life. The last five days when we were bombed by aeroplanes, staff did not even stop their work to go and look. Despite these upbeat comments, things were not going well for the Serbs and Romanians. By the 20th of October 1916, the women knew that something very disastrous had occurred somewhere. According to Yvonne, it's the vagueness of it all that appalls one. We may all of us be prisoners before the night comes. In fact, that seems at present no slender possibility. But if it's to be, it's to be. And what's the use of worrying? In a relatively rare abandonment of the upbeat manner, which is a hallmark of all suffrage writing, one diarist admits, we are ready to grouse at anything. Our tempers are best left alone. The SWH have got the starch taken out of them this time. When the nearby Romanian trenches were captured, the hospitals were ordered to retreat, an event one ambulance driver describes vividly. We started off at 10 p.m. in pitch darkness along dreadful roads. Eventually, after several hours crawling along at under 10 miles an hour, we were forced to camp for the remainder of the night. At 4 a.m. we started off again across country, 
making for a place where we were to meet the Serbian 1st Division and get further orders. All the time, we heard the guns nearer and nearer as we were going to another part of the front, Constanza. All the time, just over the hill, the shells were bursting and flames from the burning town and oil wells could be, three, could be seen. Two or three shells burst over us while we, we waited. Then the order was given to get on, retreat, and all the soldiers had to go first. And nearer, ever nearer, the booming of the guns. What's often overlooked is that how in a retreat it is the fighting men who lead the column, leaving the nurses and the wounded to retreat last. Thus, those who are the most vulnerable, or of course in military terms the most expendable, are closest to the advancing <coughs> enemy guns. Retreating became a constant feature of medical women's life on the Eastern and Balkan fronts. And indeed, during March 1918, a lot of um, British nurses were caught up in the, in the retreat when the German army was advancing in March, trying to win the war before the Americans actually got, got ready to, to fight. In an overwhelming understatement, one woman wrote in a letter home, a retreat is not a pretty sight. Some members evacuated on the unit's lorries, trying to safeguard their precious donated equipment, including a barrel of treacle, which we've refused to abandon to the advancing enemy. Perhaps they got their priorities right. Ambulance drivers drove their own, ve drove their own vehicles with their cargoes of pain-wracked men in a barely moving convoy with a vast, undulating plain ahead and ever closer behind us the crash of ever nearing guns. The drivers and their patients were soon under fire. They bivouacked in a village which was pandemonium all night with guns, guns crashing and Romanian, Russian and Serb troops all mixed up in hopeless confusion in the retreat. Proving the truth about the women providing good copy to, provide, to promote the suffrage as well as the SWH cause Newspapers at home were eager to publicise and sanitise their activities. The Daily Record informed readers that the girl orderlies successfully drove their vehicles over terrain when men failed. The Sunday Pictorial, which is now as pro-suffrage as it had been anti-suffrage before 1914, assured readers that women took their place in the firing line with the utmost courage. The SWH hospitals and refugees were now converging on the port of Constanza. They were racing for a gap ahead of the German and British and Bulgarian armies who were determined to take the strategic port. With discipline amongst both the terrified population and military personnel in short supply, civilians, ambulances and medical columns were pushed aside. In her official report to the Ed Edinburgh Committee, Elsie Ingalls recounted how cannon and ammunition wagons and squadrons of cavalry barged through this endless stream of desperate humanity. Although a telegram sent to the Edinburgh Committee stated all's well, those who had lived through the retreat were struggling to come to terms with their experiences. The very much written about chasm between the fighting man and those who have never experienced warfare is equally apparent in the writings and memoirs of all serving women irrespective of where they served. One diarist sums up both how and why this chasm starts to open. We have all agreed not to talk about it. It's no use soaking one's mind in horror, especially if it's real. And we have all seen things that we are trying to forget. No, we never, never, never shall. Whether she means never talk about it or never forget is unclear. With talks now ongoing in the corridors of power about some form of female enfranchisement in the Representation of the People Act under discussion, the NUWSS committee at home were determined to keep the women's heroism and their dedication in the public and, of course, politicians' eyes. The press agency promulgated the prefect of Constanza's elegiac words. It is extraordinary how these women endure hardship. They work like navvies. In words that were music to many suffragists' ears, he concluded, it is no wonder that England is a great country if her women are like that. Yeah. More prosaically, a young suffragist 
volunteer reflecting on her experiences concluded with the true British understatement, it was a very odd life in a rather exciting spot. For close on a century, historians claimed that the suffrage campaigns ended on the 4th of August 1914, and suffrage supporters simply became war workers, and at least they lost interest, or partial interest, in the suffrage cause, and they patiently <coughs> waited for the vote to be given to them. Whilst losing interest in the vote may have been true of Emmeline and Christabel Pankhurst, the argument undermines the way countless activists simply combined suffragism and war work. Concert parties at the front founder Lena Ashwell reflecting on her own and countless suffragists' pre-war and wartime endeavours realised. If there had not been the preparation of the suffrage movement, the women would have been able to do as little as in previous wars. The women who had come out of comfortable homes and had suffered hardships for the cause were getting ready to fight and ultimately win a bigger battle. So the few women I have told you about this evening, and the hundreds of others who I haven't had time to mention, some of whom feature in my forthcoming book and some in my already published ones, used their suffrage experience, their skills, their belief in suffragism and their nation's cause to prove that women were full citizens. Doing their bit, they had alleviated both physical and mental suffering. They had acted as counters to the insensate devilry which Millicent Forsett, Forsett had presciently foretold when she took the platform at the Kingsway Hall at Holborn at 8 p.m. on the 4th of August 1914, three hours before Great Britain entered a war that changed women and the nation forever. Thank you.